So, hey, everyone. Excited to talk to you all. Uh, like Monty said, I'm wrapping up my PhD at MIT. I'm actually in a very cool joint program between MIT and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, which is more like an ocean science-based research institute. Uh, so you'll see that show up in my work a lot. I'll talk about these things called autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs, which are just marine robots. Um, and today I'm going to spend most of it really talking about kind of the core algorithmic part of my thesis. Um, and I guess we'll get into some details as to what that means in a bit. Um, so some of this is a little outdated because I didn't think about the communications logistics. Uh, but if you're confused or like not sure what's going on, or you want me to slow down so you can kind of parse the math briefly and I'm moving too quickly, try to interrupt me. Uh, otherwise, maybe if you're like really excited about something or like you want to ask details on something I didn't go into as much depth on, um, you can like write it down or just remember it and I'll leave a good deal of time at the end. We can try to answer whatever you all want to know. Um, I might be retouching on things already covered in class. Um, so I'll try to move kind of briefly through it enough to like kind of like let you remember what's going on, but not enough that it's boring or laborious. Uh, and then finally, uh, this talk is about a very specific, I guess, subfield in terms of algorithmic research and robotics. Uh, but I'm pretty happy to discuss as well as I can anything really broadly relevant to robotic perception navigation. Um, so let's dive into it, what we're going to actually talk about. Uh, and I think this is one of my favorite pictures. It's a little outdated, so it's maybe unfair to Google now. I think they've fixed things a bit. Um, but if you used to go onto Google Maps or Google Earth way back in like the 2010s, you'd see things like this on occasion, right? Where this bridge is like terribly warped in this totally unrealistic way. And there's this obvious question, how do things like this actually happen, right? Google's obviously, you know, one of the top tech companies in the world, like something like this shouldn't be going on. Um, and the reason is there's a very, very challenging underlying technologically difficult problem. And that's what we're really gonna talk about. Uh, and these types of problems are you know, one of the leading causes of dramatic failures in modern field robotics. Um, I see them a lot in my work and it inspired my research direction. Uh, and specifically, we're going to talk about a kind of class of emerging techniques uh, that allows you to perform efficient global optimization, which really circumvents a lot of the problems that cause this terribly distorted Salvador Dali style map you're seeing. Um, I'm going to try to keep the level of math at just enough math to provide intuition and really give you a jumping off point if you want to do more research on your own. So you're not like me kind of diving in blindly when I started, you have some understanding of the keywords and the intuition behind things. So what's cool is I was actually going through your lecture notes, uh, or your slides, and I found this slide, which is maybe way back when you all were doing optimization, this remark, you know, pose synchronization has these really interesting structures and we can develop efficient global solvers. So now today we actually get to talk about a little bit what those interesting structures are and what those global solvers look like. Um, so I'm gonna start with some brief preliminaries to kind of get us on equal footing in terms of mathematical background. These are gonna be pretty loose definitions, um, but should be sufficient to give you the right intuition to get through today. Um, so there's this notion of a relaxation, specifically in terms of an optimization problem. And what's going on with a relaxation is you're weakening the constraints of your original problem in a way that gives you something that's either easier or faster to solve. So you're normally walking this trade off between problem fidelity, where you're sacrificing some details of your optimization problem to get something that's more computationally friendly. Uh, and you'll see this in a lot of areas and it'll kind of be the core piece of what we're doing today. And then getting a little more into the weeds, there's this notion of inner product, which maybe you've seen, um, you've definitely seen in terms of vectors, right? Where like the vector inner product or the dot product, you know, X transpose Y gives you a scalar value. Well, inner products are more general than that um, and go way beyond what we're gonna talk about, but I'm gonna use this bracket notation, uh, typically in the context of the matrix inner product, which has this form with respect to the trace. We don't really care about that. What's important is it's giving us some, um, idea of the similarity between two objects. So like the inner product between X and Y is saying, how similar are X and Y? A few more mathematical details. Uh, there's this idea of a positive semi-definite matrix, uh, which is just a matrix that has non-negative eigenvalues. So also eigenvalues are zero or greater. And building off of that, 
there's this idea of a semi-definite program, which is a type of convex optimization problem, where some of your variables will be constrained to be positive semi-definite. So its eigenvalues can't be negative. Uh, and this shows up in a lot of places and it's becoming increasingly common to see in some of the uh, more mathematical research areas of robotics. So taking a step back, I just wanna give a brief intro to like what drives my research? How did I actually end up here working on these problems? Um, so my research thinks broadly about this notion of autonomous teaming to perform better observation of the ocean. And what that really led me to is this notion of how do we get um, scalable marine robotics, meaning uh, scalable in terms of cost and compute. So we need algorithms that let us deploy lower cost systems. And we need those algorithms to be computationally efficient because we're deploying things in the field and we have constraints such as battery power that seriously limit our operations. I'm not gonna talk too much about the ocean today, although I think it's fascinating and this like really rich playground for research ideas and robotic problems. Um, but if anyone wants to talk about it, uh, it's one of my favorite topics. Uh, so let me know and I can talk more about what I think is really interesting in the ocean and why it's so important that we, we build this type of autonomy. So diving into this idea of low cost navigation, specifically in the marine domain, and even more specifically, I'm gonna be talking about underwater autonomy, uh, where we're dealing in with these GPS denied environments. And what's really interesting, like I said, uh, there's no GPS, and that's because we're battling this set of adversarial physics that happens when you go underwater, right? So signals attenuate way too quickly, at least in GPS frequencies. So within a few centimeters of the surface of the ocean, you've lost all sense of GPS. Cameras typically aren't useful uh, for a lot of applications. There's few, a few scenarios where they are um, and people are working on those. Um, but then, and then in addition, uh, anything we're doing in terms of underwater sensing is inherently quite noisy because we have all these weird physical properties of the ocean or of the water um, that affects our signal processing. It's quite hard to actually understand the state of the ocean. And as a result, we have a lot of unmodeled errors in our sensors. So the way people normally handle this, these the set of adversarial physics, is they just equip some robot with a very expensive inertial navigation system, which we can very loosely think of as a very, very expensive IMU, inertial measurement unit, where you can you get some set of accelerations on your translation, some set of velocities on your rotation, and you integrate these things to give you um, to give you an estimate of how your pose is changing over time. And what's interesting to point out here is inertial navigation can very loosely be thought of as a white noise process. So if we think of this black curve as the trajectory that a robot is following, and these two different shaded regions around it as kind of its region of uncertainty, right? The very large region um, is what you'd see with a very low cost inertial sensor. So the uncertainty grows quickly, um, much more so than a high cost sensor, which would be the red region. <clears throat> now really, interesting thing and use very important thing to point out here is the uncertainty grows unbounded so as time goes to infinity with inertial na purely inertial navigation we'll see your uncertainty grow to infinity and what that means is your robot becomes terribly drastically lost in most cases um, to avoid this people tend to buy those really high cost sensors when they're deploying things in the ocean um, the type of the half million dollar sensor i was referring to if deployed very well and intelligently uh, and you put the right safeguards up, will typically give you something on the order of hours of, of reliable navigation, um, at which point you'll need to surface or have some other way of kind of fixing your location. Uh, you'd surface to get a GPS fix. So my research thinks about a very different paradigm in terms of navigation. So instead of using these really expensive inertial systems, uh, I asked the question, what if we share measurements across a network of low cost AUVs? And the idea here is that the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts, right? So instead of a single very high cost sensor, which is very high quality, we can have multiple very low cost sensors. And as long as we're using them in the right way, very collaboratively, we can actually get very high quality performance uh, with a set of much lower cost equipment. A nice trick you can play here, and maybe the key to making things work um, in the underwater domain as well as elsewhere, is in this collaborative setup, you can have um, one agent or like one node that lets you provide a global fix for the entire team. 
So in our case, this could be an AUV that's floating at the surface, so it always has GPS, and it can communicate that GPS fix, that really high quality measurement, to the rest of the network of AUVs. Um, so as long as they kind of have some rough idea of the relative positioning, they can all obtain a global fix, even though only one of them really has it. So I wanna talk very quickly about the type of low cost instrumentation I think about. <clears throat> There's really two key pieces here. One is a very low cost inertial measurement unit. So it costs about $2,000, which for the world of marine robotics is low cost. Um, and the other is a little more interesting and a little more unique. It's an acoustic modem, which is kind of like a Wi-Fi modem, very similar. Um, and you get two things with these acoustic modems that are really important. One is the ability to communicate with other modems. Um, but the other is, you know, assuming we have some model of how quickly sound is traveling through the water, we actually get ranging or how far away two modems are. That's because we know when one packet was sent and when that same packet was received by the other vehicles by knowing how long it how um, how long it takes that signal to travel and how quickly that signal is traveling we can back out distance now of course because it's hard to perfectly estimate the speed of sound and water there's some uncertainty there and we have to deal with those errors so i'm going to briefly kind of draw out the factor graph for what this would look like make sure we're all on the same page so assume we have this team of three vehicles um, time step one, time step two, time step two. Um, we'll have some inertial odometry between the two vehicles, right? Or between the vehicles at the two time steps. And that'll be something that looks like a six degree of freedom relative change in pose. <clears throat> and then also we'll have some acoustic ranging between the separate vehicles at the same time step. Now it's important to note, and we're not gonna dive into it too much now, um, but adds a lot of flavor to this research problem is these range measurements are purely distance. So it's saying, I know how far apart these vehicles are, but I don't actually know what direction they're in. There's some ambiguity there that has to be resolved. Um, and that's a large part of the research problem we deal with. And briefly, before I get into the techniques, I wanna point out that this problem generalizes quite well beyond AUV navigation. And I'll show some experiments uh, on other domains. Um, but so these types of problems were emerging odometry or relative pose measurements and ranging show up not just in the marine domain, but also in uh, like aerial drones, UAVs. You'll see there's been some recent research in terms of multi-UAV um, localization. And then you'll also see uh, these problems show up in the AR VR space. Actually, the MetaQuest, I believe now has an ultra wideband chip in it, which is um, kind of the standard way of performing ranging. Um, yeah, uh, I should say at least in consumer electronics, like your iPhone actually probably also has an ultra wideband chip. <clears throat> and the reason why it generalizes so well is there's a wide range of sensors that might show up, right? So we have these ultra wideband chips I'm talking about, which are just a type of radio. There's obviously the acoustic ranging I've talked about. Uh, you'll even see people um, try to do things called like Wi-Fi slam or Wi-Fi based navigation because the exact same principles, you know, that we talked about in the acoustic domain transferred to the Wi-Fi domain. Now the signals differ a bit, so the signal processing changes, but the underlying navigation problems more or less the same. So to formalize this navigation problem a little more, uh, we're gonna talk about something that maybe you've already seen, which is maximum likelihood estimation, which we kind of loosely think about is let's try to find the set of states that best explain these noisy measurements we have. Um, and if we frame it a little more formally, you know, we have this conditional likelihood we're looking at. So the conditional likelihood of the robot states given the measurements we have, and we want to find the state that maximizes that density. Um, and typically in SLAM or robot navigation, this requires some assumption on the probabilistic na uh, nature of your sensors. It's so like with acoustic ranging, what that means is we have some measured distance, uh, which we'll assume to be the true distance, plus or minus some Gaussian noise. Um, that introduces the error into our system. So it's a very clean, probabilistically elegant model that more or less works in real world settings. <clears throat> now, if we try to graphically describe what this problem looks like, we have the same conditional distribution uh, over X, and we're just trying to find the, the peak of the distribution, right? So the most likely point, which we'll call the optimal state. And what's nice about that, uh, even when we say the word optimal state, we're maybe already thinking this, 
is it gives us the paradigm of performing navigation as an optimization problem. Probably not something new to you all in this class. <clears throat> right, and the caveat is that the variables we're working with tend to be quite high dimensional, right? So dimension in order of thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands on the upper end, at least of the problems I've seen. And as a result, to get real-time performance, we resort to performing local optimization using something like the levenberg marquardt method, meaning we provide some initial guess, in this case, of the relative trajectories of our agents. And we, we optimize uh, using something we can loosely think of as gradient-seeking behavior uh, to arrive at some local optimum. Now there's a catch here, which maybe you've already seen, which is that the distributions we actually deal with in practice look more like this, right? So they have all these local minima that we're battling all the time. <clears throat> and specifically, you know, we would describe this as a non-convex problem. These local minima are introduced by various non-linearities that show up in the problem, uh, both due to the nature of the special orthogonal group, as well as some non-linearities in our uh, ranging sensors. And the issue here is now if I give you some arbitrary initial guess, there's a decent chance that you arrive at some locally optimal solution that's quite different from your globally optimal solutions. We can get right very wrong very quickly. Now, the two really key takeaways here, uh, one may be obvious now, which is that solution quality is inherently very dependent on the initialization we, we provide, right? So good initial guess, good solution, bad initial guess could be very bad solution. Now, the other, the other issue here is maybe a little more nuanced, uh, which is because it's a non-convex problem, we don't even have an efficient way of verifying if our solution is correct. Meaning I could get the globally optimal solution every time, but I have no way of knowing that I have a globally optimal solution. So I'm kind of flying blind. Conversely, I could have a very incorrect solution um, and just keep going with it because I have no way of knowing that my solution is suboptimal. And really these two issues, initialization and uh, verification are kind of key limitations in performing this type of low cost multi-AV navigation I've described. There's been some really great set of works, um, you know, going all the way back to the 2000s, as, as I'm aware, probably earlier than that, if you looked closely, um, trying to, to demonstrate these types of systems. Uh, but these two issues have kind of always persisted. There hasn't really been a good answer. And that's really prevented some real world adoption of these types of technologies. I want to point out that initialization is particularly hard because range measurements have these ambiguities, right? One range measurement means the other agent probably lives somewhere on a sphere, right? But we don't actually know where on a sphere relative to where the measurement was obtained from, meaning it's very difficult to say what's the relative alignment of these two agents' trajectories or what's the relative position. And there's been a set of works even just trying to initialize um, these problems. In fact, I've done some. I'll reference that in a second. <clears throat> but before I do that, I uh, want to introduce some real world demonstrations of this type of problem. Uh, so this will kind of run throughout the talk for a little bit, these experiments, kind of demonstrating why these problems are really issues. So uh, laying out the groundwork, um, we have this yellow vehicle on the top left which is a, an autonomous jet yak. It's really great, it, like just drives itself around. So some of my best testing days were just sitting in this vehicle, like letting it do all the work, um, but it's GPS equipped. Uh, and then both the vehicles have inertial measurement units, um, roughly $2,000 ones and acoustic modems. They can perform acoustic range in between each other. And I should say the blue vehicle has GPS, but we don't use it. Uh, that's just to give us ground truth. That's not actually as a navigation aid. <clears throat> so laying things out, um, between each vehicle, there's about $12,000 in terms of navigation equipment. The exact same sensors I talked about on the AUV earlier are deployed on these vehicles right here. Um, and the yellow vehicle, because it has GPS, we'll almost think of it as a moving GPS beacon. So it's going to serve the role of, of that AUV floating at the surface, keeping a constant GPS fix. Now, the, the system's really cool um, because it's a good proxy for a lot of different experiments, right? The multi-AUV experiments being one. Um, another set of experiments, and actually what funded maybe the beginning of, of this work or these, these uh, particular river experiments, is the notion of um, a human diver teaming with an AUV, trying to see if the AUV can help the diver navigate to a given position uh, underwater because human navigation is especially underwater, is quite difficult, quite challenging. There's not much you can see 
um, human divers actually really interesting typically rely on counting their kicks to, to get a guess of how far they've traveled. So you can imagine it's quite a noisy process and you're almost entirely subject to how the currents are pushing you around. So I'm gonna lay out the experiment we did. Um, so we're trying to navigate the blue vehicle to a given point and we're performing online state estimation with it. Um, that blue curve you see in this animation here is the odometry. So it's just the inertial measurements integrated for the vehicle uh, over the course of the transit. The red curve is the ground truth position. So it's what we hope the blue curve would look like, but we can see they're quite different. Those green stars are actually our moving GPS beacon. So it's kind of circling um, the blue vehicle in this, in this experiment. And those little uh, lines we see are the acoustic ranges. So it's where we're getting communication and a distance measurement between the two vehicles. So the obvious question to ask is what happens when we try local optimization? I've kind of set it up to be the bad guy here. Um, and this is the result you see. So we initialize the problem uh, using odometry. So exactly what you do, um, kind of like the standard state of the art approach. We're using GTSAM with, Levin, uh, with the Levenberg Marquat solver. Um, which is, you know, in my mind, more or less the state of the art, what everyone's using. And what we see here is uh, the solution gets bent out of shape in all these weird ways, right? It's very obviously incorrect. Um, it's telling us our vehicle's spinning around in circles and batches, which we almost certainly know isn't the case. We can tell by the GPS isn't true. Um, so what this represents is like this terribly incorrect trajectory, just like, uh, just like our melting bridge. And in practice, what this would lead to is a, an AUV that's completely lost in space. Um, maybe we've lost whatever's on it. Maybe the AUV is going to start behaving very erratically because its state estimate doesn't match the real world conditions. Bad things will happen. So I've worked on a range of different things uh, to kind of address these problems that arise with this very specific um, state estimation problem. Uh, one work being how can we actually plan trajectories for large teams um, to lead to more reliable estimation problems. Another being how can we actually initialize these solutions, uh, just like I referenced earlier. And then finally, the one I'm really going to talk about today is how can we perform efficient global optimization for these types of problems. And I want to point out this work is going to be is called Cora, so I'll be using the name Cora kind of throughout this talk. We can think of it as synonymous with global optimization for this specific range-based navigation problem. <clears throat> so CORE is a new approach. Uh, you can find the paper on archive. I'm happy to refer anyone to it. Um, and I want to start by just showing you what CORE looks like um, or what the solution from CORE looks like. So this green trajectory is, is um, the new equivalent of that really weird twisted up yellow shape you saw before. And as we can see, the green trajectory almost perfectly matches the GPS ground truth. In fact, if you take those two trajectories and you crunch some numbers, you end up with a positional root mean squared error of about one and a half meters uh, over a transit that I think was about 350 meters in length, you know, roughly a 300 meter by 100 meter box uh, was what we filled. And what's really cool about this is if you remember all the way back to what's actually on these vehicles is about $12,000 worth of navigation equipment. But this root mean squared error is comparable to what you'd expect to see with something that looks like a $200,000 inertial navigation um, setup. So if you do the math, what that looks like is about an order of magnitude improvement in terms of capability for that given uh, cost point. So what's really cool uh, is Cora fixes both of those limitations I highlighted earlier. So one, Core is capable of efficiently obtaining globally optimal solutions without any dependence on the initialization you provide. Um, and this is only this is true for realistic noise regimes, right? So there are adversarial cases where that doesn't hold, and we can talk about that more. And the second capability Core provides uh, is the ability to generate certificates um, that guarantee whether a solution is globally optimal or not. So what's that, what that's giving us is actually real-time verification that our system is working correctly. Now, I have an animation I like to show that really highlights this first point, the initialization independence. So what I'm doing here is just initializing Cora with a completely random jumbled up solution. It's actually completely just randomly sampled a bunch of points and called them my initialization. And as you can see, Cora kind of untangles that weird uh, initial guess 
escapes all the local minima and arrives at a solution that, you know, almost perfectly matches what we'd expect. <clears throat> now, outside of the marine domain, because we're not all marine roboticists, unfortunately, um, Cora generalizes quite well. Right, so this, these experiments on the far left are actually with an autonomous wheel, uh, lawnmower um, with different types of odometry, right? They used wheel and uh, some degree of inertial odometry to get their odometry and ultra wideband radios to perform ranging. And on the far right, we have an experiment with five turtle bots using uh, visual odometry and ultra wideband ranging. So it generalizes well to all these other problems I referred to. So now that I've showed you what it does and why it's worth knowing about, uh, let's dive a little bit into how it works. Uh, I'll start with kind of a high level overview of the pieces we'll go into. Um, so the key starting point to Cora is actually the right problem formulation, right? So it's a very novel formulation we use, or I used, uh, and we'll dive into that. But the key thing to know right now is that the uh, formulation or the problem takes the form of a QCQP, a quadratically constrained quadratic program. And what that looks like is this blue curve you see on the right, um, which is obviously non-convex, but still has the original problem or the original issues of non-convexity. What's nice about QCQPs is from them, you can actually easily generate uh, a lower bounding problem or more precisely a convex relaxation. And specifically, this relaxation takes the form of a semi-definite program in SDP. And as you can see here, this new red curve, or, which is you know, mimicking our SDP, um, is convex, right? So a local minima is equal to a global minima. And importantly, it lower bounds uh, the QCQP at all points. So it's always underneath the QCQP, though they may touch. And then finally, um, the third kind of key piece to core we're going to go into is the notion of certification. So given a candidate solution, can I verify if that candidate is actually a truly optimal solution. And at a very high level, what that looks like um, is evaluating a set of optimality conditions. Namely, does a given solution to the QCQP solve the SDP? If it solves the SDP, then the two have the same cost at that point. Uh, and we know it's optimal for the SDP, which lower bounds the QCQP. So, so it must be optimal for the QCQP. It's kind of a lot of uh, word jumbling there, but I think hopefully you'll get the idea. Now, if you've been paying close attention, you might notice there's still something missing. Um, so I've set up a way of certifying solutions, but I haven't actually talked about how you can obtain solutions. Right? So our two key issues here are that the QCQP is non-convex, right? so it depends on the initialization. We can't guarantee that a given initialization will get to the globally optimal solution. And then if we just looked at the SDP kind of as a standard SDP, and we applied kind of the typical interior point solvers, we'd see... Uh, and a computational cost that scales on the order of n to the six, right? So in practice, you know, once we get to variables greater than size 100 or maybe 1,000, if you're patient and okay with your laptop starting to burn a hole through your desk, um, once we scale past that 100 to 1,000 range, we're no longer even computationally feasible, you know? We might be waiting till the heat death of the universe. <clears throat> so let's talk about how we actually perform global optimization. And what's cool is there's this very simple three-step process uh, that Cora uses, right? So we begin with local optimization, meaning we take some initial point, we locally refine it, get a local optimum. We can then check if that point is globally optimal. If so, we're done. Everyone's happy. If not, then we actually slightly relax the problem. So we increase the dimensionality of our problem just a tiny bit to give us a descent direction and eliminate some of those non-convexities. And we do the same thing again. We locally optimize. We check, uh, we check the optimality. We can kind of rinse and repeat the solution until eventually we get to a globally optimal solution. And what's nice, I'm not going to talk about it today, um, but there's actually, there are theoretical guarantees on how much relaxation you have to do to get to this globally optimal solution. In practice, we normally only have to go, you know, two or three relaxations before we can get there. So let's get a little more into the nuts and bolts of how Cora works. And let's start with this QCQP we were talking about. <clears throat> so maybe I should start by introducing what is a QCQP to make sure we're all on the same page, right? So we have this standard uh, optimization formulation, minimize some costs subject to some equality constraints. That's all we're going to think about today. <clears throat> and in our case, the cost is quadratic, right? QCQP. Um, 
and specifically in Quora, it's convex, right? So this um, this very simplified demonstration of this kind of parabolic shape is actually a decent enough intuition for what we're dealing with. Now, in terms of constraints, they're also quadratic, uh, but they're non-convex in our case. They're a little more complicated. And what we can think of is, as we see this ellipsoid, which is a quadratic shape, uh, is that the x, y, z values um, of the feasible set must be on the surface of the ellipsoid. So it can walk around the surface, uh, kind of like a manifold, actually exactly like a manifold. Um, but we can't actually pass through the ellipsoid, meaning it's non-convex, because not all points uh, between two feasible points are feasible themselves. <clears throat> And I should say, um, in general, QCQP geometry can be more complex, uh, but we don't really need to worry about it for today. <clears throat> so let's talk about how we actually get to a QCQP with our problem. So we have the maximum likelihood problem, uh, which is obtained from that maximum likely, the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimate uh, we're trying to obtain. <clears throat> and if we break it down, uh, these first two cost terms represent our relative pose measurements or what we'd expect from our odometry. So just saying our pose is changing, you know, a certain amount from time step one to time step two. And then this last set of cost terms represent our range measurements. So they're just trying to reconcile the translations of a vehicle or of an object or an agent based on distance measurements between them. And what's really key to point out uh, is that arriving at even just this maximum likelihood problem depends on very specific noise models for our sensors. Um, so I, there, there is some detail there and some nuance that's uh, kind of fun to go into, but maybe I'll skip over it right now. I'm happy to talk about it later. <clears throat> From this maximum likelihood problem, uh, we can form a QCQP reformulation, technically a relaxation of the original problem. And there's two key pieces to that. So the first piece is we're actually gonna relax the special orthogonal group to the orthogonal group. Meaning that um, that determinant constraint, uh, the determinant of R has to be equal to positive one, we're gonna throw that away. So now the determinant can be either positive or negative one. We'll talk about that more. The other reformulation that we won't get into as much detail uh, is actually the introduction of some auxiliary variables um, that allow us to lift these range measurements, not just from scalar distance measurements, but to vector valued measurements in some sense. <clears throat> and what, what these two reformulations let us do or allow uh, is now um, the cost function that we care about is purely quadratic. Right, so that shows up in the range cost, which is now quadratic before it was this kind of weird non-convex shape. And our constraints are entirely quadratic, right? R transpose R equals I is a quadratic constraint. Um, and the auxiliary variables have this kind of unique unit sphere constraint. So I wanna talk a little bit about relaxing uh, to the orthogonal group, because uh, it provides some really interesting intuition for what you're allowed to do and might help guide some of your future thoughts as you're attempting your own research. Right, so we have these two constraints that show up in the special orthogonal group, right? R transpose R equals I, determinant is equal to one. <clears throat> now that first set of constraints is quadratic, like we saw, right? We can think of it as, you know, must be on the surface of the ellipsoid or even simpler in the 2D case, you know, we're tracking around the, the perimeter of a circle. Um, however, the determinant constraint, there's a few different ways you can pose it, but it's never really friendly. Um, in the most like default case, you'd view it as a polynomial constraint on the entries of the problem. Specifically, what we're constraining is the product of the eigenvalues of R um, must equal one, which becomes really weird and difficult to enforce. <clears throat> and the reason why you can get away with throwing away the determinant, at least at an intuitive level, um, is when you think about shifting from the special orthogonal group to just the orthogonal group, what you're doing is introducing a completely separate disjoint set, right? So this R transpose R equals I constraint that shows up in the orthogonal group uh, <clears throat> actually denotes two separate smooth manifolds, right? One with the terminant positive one, one with the terminant negative one. And it turns out in practice um, with the types of data we see in the real world, oftentimes your solutions will end up uh, belonging entirely to one or the other. So all of your determinants will be positive one or all will be negative one. And if they're all negative one, what you can do is just reflect them over. So you take the reflection of your solution and you get an equally optimal solution. Um, there's some semi-interesting tricks there. 
uh, that I can also talk about later, but I'll leave it at that for now. The real takeaway here that I want to drive home um, is that in practice, not all of these constraints actually matter, <clears throat> or at least are, are equally important. So it really depends on the problems you're dealing with. And sometimes it pays off to say, wow, this constraint's like really, really um, impeding our progress. What happens if we just ignore it? What does our problem look like now? Right, so in our case, actually ignoring the determinant leads to a much easier to solve optimization problem that has the structure we want without really sacrificing anything. So I wanna talk about how <clears throat> with this constraint um, or with the constraints we've talked about, this actually packs into a QCQP. Mostly I wanna introduce this uh, big X variable that'll show up throughout the remainder of the talk. Um, and what X is, is really just a concatenation of the different variables we already introduced. So we just stack them side by side, or really on top of each other. So this is X transpose, um, doesn't matter a ton. So, you know, our first block might be our set of rotations, and then we pack all of our translations, and finally we can pack in all of our auxiliary variables. Now, why that's useful and how this shows up in a quadratic form is actually when we take this outer product, so x times x transpose, along the block diagonals, we start seeing these entries that look like r1 transpose times r1, r2 transpose times r2. And this, this form, this quadratic form, we can actually constrain and just say these block entries need to be equal to the identity and we can leave all the other entries unconstrained. <clears throat> so now we have these quadratic equality constraints using this uh, kind of like stacked matrix form. So now we have a QCQP. Uh, hopefully you can believe me that you can um, formulate the problem I showed you earlier into something that looks like this, right? We're taking the inner product of some cost matrix Q with, um, with this quadratic form. And equivalently, all of our constraints um, can be expressed like this, where we have some matrix that defines our constraints. Uh, inner product with the quadratic form results in uh, all of the orthogonality constraints we talked about previously. And the big, big thing here is this gives us the QCQP we've been looking for. So now let's talk about how we actually get a semi-definite program from this QCQP. <clears throat> so where does this come from? Right, so now we have this, this XX transpose form of our QCQP, which is nice, it looks really clean. It's a three-liner, it makes me happy. <clears throat> what we're gonna do uh, is actually something really interesting. We're gonna introduce a variable substitution. So instead of thinking about X times X transpose, we'll introduce a new Z that's you know the size of that outer product. And we're going to say that Z has to be positive semi-definite, which is a product kind of, or which is um, a property kind of implicitly formed when you take X times X transpose. And if we say the rank of Z is capped by the size of, of X, right? So the skinny dimension of X, then we actually have an entirely equivalent substitution. Um, it's maybe not intuitive at first, so I'll give people a second to think about it or absorb it. <clears throat> All right, so assuming you can perform the substitution, which you can, you can trust me, um, when you drop Z in to the original problem with these new constraints, so the positive semi-definite constraint and constraining the rank, we have a completely equivalent problem. But we have an issue, which is this rank of Z constraint um, is actually a non-convex constraint. We'd call this a rank-restricted or rank-constrained semi-definite program. So we still have this non-convex problem. So we have the QCQP, we have this new intermediate problem with this kind of tricky constraint we're battling. Um, and maybe surprisingly enough, what we do is exactly what we did before, which is we have a constraint we don't like, we're just going to ignore it and see what happens. It turns out when you drop that, because it's the only remaining non-convexity in your problem, you now have a convex semi-definite program. <clears throat> So really emphasizing, knowing what's hurting you uh, and experimenting with it, seeing, can I drop the constraint? Will it, will I lose much um, in terms of problem fidelity? Can oftentimes pay huge dividends, uh, right? It made our problem much friendlier and gave us a lot of nice theoretical properties in terms of convexity. A little fun historical note, um, the STP we just talked about is commonly referred to as Shor's relaxation or the Shor relaxation, uh, which is, you know, kind of now very widely used um, in this regime of QCQP and semi-definite relaxations. 
but it's something you probably wouldn't come across unless you're, you know, an avid reader of Soviet era math journals. Okay, so we have a semi-definite program, right? We have this nice form. I think you can now believe me that this is a reasonable form for things to take and you understand how we could get here. <clears throat> the final piece of the puzzle is how do we actually perform certification? Right, and I have these two equations I've kind of been flashing. Um, let's talk about where these equations come from and what they mean. <clears throat> now the key thing here, and what's hopefully evident throughout the, the rest of these slides is these equations are equivalent to the optimality conditions uh, of the specific problems we're dealing with. And specifically, these are KKT conditions. I'll define them more. <clears throat> so introducing a little more terminology, all right, we have these KKT conditions or Karushkun-Tucker conditions that show up. And at a very loose level, uh, all you need to know or think about is if these KKT conditions are satisfied for any optimization problem, at least, or any of our optimization problems, um, no, any optimization problem, then the point is first order critical. Meaning it could be a local minima, a local maxima, or a saddle point, but locally it's you know first order optimal. <clears throat> What's really important for a semi-definite program, our SDP, is due to specific structure of our, our SDP, namely linearity. Um, the KKT conditions actually guarantee um, global optimality. So if a point satisfies the KKT conditions for this SDP, we have a globally optimal point. <clears throat> so I want to provide some intuition for what the KKT conditions are doing, so you don't have to just you know take me at face value. So if we think about optimization as having this type of lost landscape, this kind of green curvature, right, where the center is, you know, the minimum that we want to move to. But we have some constraint that looks like this red curve here. So our uh, that little gray ball we have is maybe our current point that we're considering, and the ball is constrained to move along the red curve. <clears throat> the first thing that shows up in the KKT conditions uh, is the gradient of the uh, the cost function we're minimizing. So that new, new arrow, that new vector we have is saying, if we move in this direction, we're decreasing the cost. That's our gradient of the cost. But then we also have another vector, which is um, you know, the gradient of our constraint. And what that vector tells us is kind of what direction the constraint is resisting um, movement in. So what the KKT condition is really doing, or what we're really looking at, um, is this condition is satisfied when the gradient of the cost is completely resisted by the constraints, meaning there's not really a local descent direction um, that we can feasibly move in. So I'm going to provide a little more intuition as we get a little math here. So here's like the bulk equations. You maybe don't really need to deeply understand them right now, um, but if you want to get into this work or really understand what's going on, it's good to, to refer back to and go through. <clears throat> So this first set of equations is actually just saying, is our point X or Z feasible? Does it satisfy the constraints we care about? The second set of conditions is now mimicking that uh, prior property I was talking about. Namely, is there no local descent direction from this point? You know, are the constraints completely absorbing um, the gradient? And what's really cool about this, or what's really interesting and maybe popping out, is there's one extra condition that shows up in our SDP that doesn't show up in our QCQP. And what this one condition is doing, right, is S positive semi-definite effectively allows us to distinguish global optima from local optima. So now maybe the question becomes, how do we actually check these optimality criteria? I've laid out the pieces of what matters. I've highlighted this important positive semi-definiteness check. But I haven't really given you an algorithm for working with it. <clears throat> so we have all these equations, um, but what's great to know is, you know, S is built from all of these things you see here at the very top, but only one of them is unknown, right? Q is our cost matrix, so it's known for a given problem, and AI defines our constraints, so we know it. So really what we're doing um, is trying to figure out the lambdas, or try to find if there's a lambda that exists that satisfy uh, the lower two equations, right? S times X equals zero, and is S positive semi-definite. And what's nice about lambda is it also has a very geometric intuition, 
Uh, and effectively what it tells us when we solve for it is how much each constraint is resisting the gradient. Um, some people talk about this as the sensitivity of your problem to a given constraint. So if your lambda is very high for a specific constraint, what that's telling us is if you relax that constraint, your solution will substantially change, uh, at least to the first order, because now you can move uh, in the direction of the gradient that's being absorbed. A really nice insight that follows um, from the set of equations because we've identified that lambda is the only unknown uh, and you know these are all linear operations we're, we're working with is this x times x equals zero actually allows us to solve for lambdas by solving a linear system of equations right so it's typically a very computationally efficient and stable operation <clears throat> but there's a catch uh, which is a really fun catch that i want to talk about which is that s times x equals zero. So solving for these lambdas actually doesn't guarantee uniqueness, right? Because this linear system isn't guaranteed to be a linearly independent system of equations, meaning there could be multiple lambdas that satisfy the solution in general. And the, uh, the implication of that is it's possible for you to obtain a globally optimal solution. So something that does solve the SDP but because there's not a unique S, right? There's many different S's that may satisfy the solution. You could possibly find an S that satisfies S times X equals zero, but isn't positive semi-definite. So what, what we're really looking at here is like maybe you found a globally optimal solution, but you're not able to verify it unless you find the right S out of a possibly infinite number of S's. <clears throat> So this raises the question, when is the system uniquely determined? It seems like that's a really important property for us to have. <clears throat> so um, if we look at this figure I have on the right, there's these two curves, right, which represent two different constraints now. And for each constraint, we have two different vectors representing the gradient at that point. <clears throat> so for S to be uniquely defined, actually geometrically means those two vectors must be linearly independent. Or if we had more constraints, then all of the vectors must uh, must form a linearly independent set or basis. Um, so they don't need to be perfectly orthogonal, but they can't be dependent with each other. Or um, in the case of two vectors, they can't be perfectly aligned. <clears throat> and this property uh, is kind of known as the linear independence constraint qualification. So when these two vec when your um, constraint gradients are linearly independent, the LICQ is said to hold. And I want to highlight this equation on the left, um, which is just the gradient of our constraints. Uh, it happens for our form. It evaluates something very simple, right? So it's just the constraint matrix, a sub i times x times the point we're looking at. I'm going to briefly introduce a little bit of mathematical operation, um, just because it will show up in a second, which is the row-wise vectorization of a matrix. So let's say I have a given matrix um, with a bunch of rows. The row-wise vectorization is just taking all of these rows and stacking them on top of each other into a, into a vector. <clears throat> and that'll show up in how we actually check the LICQ. So kind of holding on to this notion or this, this form of the gradient of the constraint we're looking at, we can build this matrix K, which is actually for each constraint, you know, take the gradient and vectorize it. And that gives us a big column. And now for, for every constraint, do that. Stack them next to each other into hopefully a tall, skinny matrix. <clears throat> and it turns out if this matrix, which we'll call K, has full column rank, so if all of the columns are linearly independent, then what we have is uh, the LICQ, right? It means that each of these gradients must be linearly independent or must form a linearly independent basis. And as a result, we're good. The LICQ is satisfied. What's really cool is actually for our specific problem, Cora, the one I've set up, you can prove in general that the LICQ is always satisfied. And there's a fun takeaway here, um, which is that, you know, it requires a lot of mathematical work. It wasn't something that immediately fell out. You had to kind of stare at things and think about what you needed um, and put the effort in to get there. But you can actually leverage problem structure in this case to perform efficient global optimality certification uh, right, so what we've done uh, is show that the LICQ holds in general. So this linearly linear um, system of equations has a unique solution that we can solve for using sparse linear algebra. And then all we need to do 
is pack this into the matrix S that we're looking at and evaluate if it's positive semi-definite. So we can just calculate a minimum eigenvalue or some other way of checking its positive semi-definiteness. All of these are very fast, sparse linear algebra operations. Um, so we can do it in the order of uh, hundreds of milliseconds for very large problems. So now we've discussed these optimality conditions um, that really give Cora its legs and abilities to do things. Um, I'm going to highlight those two points again, right? So the methodology we talked about requires the LACQ uh, to hold the linear independence constraint qualification. But as a result, all we have to do is solve a linearly squares problem and compute a minimum eigenvalue. So it's computationally very, very fast, which lets us actually perform these operations in real world robotics in real time. <clears throat> now tying it all together, uh, we've now kind of seen the nuts and bolts behind how this efficient global optimization works. I could talk a little bit about how um, we actually form these relaxations of the QCQP. Uh, but honestly, once you understand the first three pieces, um, this, this notion of relaxing the QCQP by growing the dimensions kind of falls out naturally. Right? If we think about X as those tall, skinny matrices I had before, then relaxing X is just kind of adding another column. So adding one more dimension to that skinny dimension. Um, so it slightly relaxes it, gives it a little more wiggle room to to descend. <clears throat> a fun piece for those who are really into the section on Lie groups or maybe really into manifold geometry or manifold optimization uh, is if you really look at the constraints we're working with um, in terms of these QCQPs, you can show that the local optimization we want to perform in the QCQP is exactly equivalent to performing Ramanian optimization over the Stiefel manifold um, and the oblique manifold. So that's, that requires a bit more detailing, is honestly more like cranking through some math uh, than, um, than providing like a high level insight, but it's something quite useful, right? Because what this gives us is efficient, more efficient and more stable optimization. And it's kind of one of those cases where there's maybe some more underlying problem structure than even you expect at first. So now I've talked a lot, I'm gonna briefly recap some things. Um, the first is maybe the obvious one to you all, which is navigation can be posed as an optimization problem, and I think often should, because it gives us a lot of beautiful structure to pull on. The second being one that maybe you've seen in your optimization section, which is there are these fundamental difficulties that show up in these navigation problems. Namely, we have uh, substantial non-convexity, and as a result, we deal with local optima, and we have no way of actually verifying our solution. But finally, um, with substantial algorithmic advancement, we can overcome these challenges in, in somewhat surprising cases, right? So we can perform global optimization, um, now be independent of whatever our initialization is, and we can actually verify that our system is operating properly in real time. <clears throat> so that's a lot of my work. I want to talk a little bit about what else is out there. And um, this is an, an incredibly non-exhaustive list, right? There are many other problem areas that are currently being developed or explored with these techniques. Um, but those of you who've been following it maybe know that um, maybe the first work in terms of really performing efficient real-time global optimization in robotics uh, solved the case of PoseGraph Slam. So a specific instance of the problem I talked about where we ignore these range measurements that introduced problems. Um, more recently, there's been work in what's called continuous time localization, uh, where they're also using range measurements, but with a very different formulation. Uh, and then some really exciting work that happened a few years ago um, showed that you can perform point cloud registration or relative pose estimation with these same types of global uh, optimality guarantees, or at least global optimality verification. Um, sometimes actually obtaining a globally optimal solution um, can't be done quite as efficiently. And that actually ends up becoming a distinction of the LICQ, right? So typically when the LICQ holds, you can do this type of efficient global optimization, but in many problems or many formulations that may not be the case. Um, so determining whether or not it's true for your specific formulation becomes a key thing. Now beyond this kind of very nearest neighbors subset of problems, um, there are also these other global optimization techniques that are being developed and explored, right? So namely some of squares optimization, um, which leverages a lot of semi-definite programming under the hood, as well as branch and bound, which is more kind of a combinatorial um, exploration approach. 
Um, both of these have recently been applied to both perception, uh, perception problems, as well as other fields of robotics. Um, in addition, you know, I focused on these perception problems because uh, they're the nearest nearest neighbors to my my uh, specific subset. But there are other areas of robotics that are seeing increasing interest with these techniques, right? So those include things like motion planning. I think even some of Monty's recent work has been using some of Square's optimization, if I'm not incorrect, uh, as well as applications to controls, which harks back, you know, many years even. Um, and more recent works in terms of neural network verification or reachability analysis. So can a learned controller um, be shown to have some nice safe properties as well as many others that, you know, I'm certainly leaving off of this list. So there's maybe the question, what's left to be done, um, right? What I talked about is a very specific case where we leveraged a ton of problem structure to obtain a very efficient way of solving these problems, right? So I think of Cora is maybe on the far um, or on the low generality end, but high computational efficiency end of today's curves. Um, on the far end, there are very, very general techniques uh, that just consider problems at the SDP level without um, leveraging any problem-specific structures. And those obviously tend to generalize quite well as long as you can find an SDP or QCQP formulation, but they may not have um, the types of computational speed that we, we would like to see in today's systems. Um, and there's other, there's other ways of getting around it, right? There's quite a diverse set of solutions you can try, like maybe solve um, with a local solver. A lot of people are doing that and then just try to verify the solution, right? So not actually guarantee you can obtain a global optim globally optimal solution, but use um, non-optimal fast local solvers and see if you stumble upon a global solution. And oftentimes that, that can work for specific problems. Um, but so, so anyways, um, kind of bridging this gap between general purpose um, techniques and computationally efficient techniques is maybe the most exciting uh, direction for future research in the specific subfield, right? So how can we get things that are more general and can, um, can capture some of the other problem structure we care about while still having the same runtime advantages? And then another one that um, oftentimes practitioners talk about, but I find doesn't show up in literature quite as much this is notion of suboptimality analysis, because normally, you know, it's nice to say that we have a globally optimal solution, um, but we're always dealing with these, you know, various computer imprecisions, right? Precision errors. So there's this open question, like, how close do we need to get to the globally optimal solution to say things are good enough? And can we actually um, identify like some threshold, right? So from um, the certificate we generate, Right, if it's very close to PSD, but not quite, can we say how far away we are from the globally optimal solution? And maybe we can empirically or analytically determine how far away is normally good enough for our use cases, right? Because we care about putting things into the real world. We don't just care about performing nice, beautiful theory. So with that, I've gotten to talk a lot about some of my favorite topics um, and I'd like to open the floor to any questions.